Um, and next up, let me share my screen. For our final presentation for today, we have tips and tricks for optimizing problem detection with Zavix. Always good to hear a thing or two about problem detection, how you can fine tune it. And this presentation will be presented by uh, my colleague, Victor, technical support engineer at Zavix. Victor, you have the floor. Thank you, Arthurs. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, let's talk about some tips and tricks, how we can fine tune our problem detection in Zabbix. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening for those in Europe. Uh, so let's start talking about how problems are detected in Zabbix. Well, this is quite basic, I know. But it's always good to understand how it's actually happening, what is actually happening. So Zabbix is constantly collecting metrics with items. Sometimes we have some, most of the items that we have are collected with some uh, update intervals and some others don't even need that. Anyway, any collected value can be evaluated against a logical expression. So every time we have an item, uh, collecting a new value, we'll have a trigger, we can have a trigger to evaluate the values that have been collected. So if uh, that value is higher than some threshold or it meets up some conditions, then we'll have a problem. We use triggers, let me just grab that here. We use triggers to evaluate those guys, right? Nothing, nothing new here. If the trigger expression is true, that means that we have a problem. If we, it's not true, then it's okay. Uh, here's a real simple example of memory utilization. If my percent, percentage of memory utilization on my server is higher than 90%, then that means I have a problem. So it's pretty basic. Let's go a little deeper. Uh, how does a trigger expression look like? We have here a syntax, and this syntax has been available since I believe 6.0. I don't remember if 5.4 already had this syntax, but if you are a old, a new, an old user of Zabbix, you might notice that it has syntax changed. To me, it's actually way simpler than it, it was. The function, nah, uh, then we, we have here the expression of a simple uh, trigger. We have a function which allows us to calculate the collected values, get the average, minimum, maximum, and um, the sum of the digital values. While you can also find strings, reference, current time, and other factors. Depending on the function, it will require some additional parameters. Additional parameters are really used for most of the, of the functions. Okay, uh, every function will evaluate a value from an item, and we need to have the reference for that item here as the item key, which must exist in the host as well. So both of these guys must exist. Yeah, I'm back. I'm really sorry about that. Whole day for this to happen, it happens during the presentation. Of course. <laughs> Feel free to continue. OK, so uh, as I was saying, the the trigger that I have here is pretty simple. I'm getting the average value of the percentage used of my memory utilization. And if the average value of this guy is over 90%, then we have a problem. <clears throat> okay, functions, the magic behind the triggers. The functions are what are really calculating the, the, <clears throat> the triggers, evaluating the triggers. Without the function, the triggers are not, okay? The, the, these functions, we can find the whole list of them on our documentation. I can show you here if you are not familiar with this. Let me just open the browser here. Documentation subjects, then you can go over here, manual, appendixes, and you have here supported macros. So if you click here in supported macros, you see the same table that I have in my presentation. And in here, you can find all the details about each function. So let's say I want to check something about uh, the change function. I have here the syntax of it, and I have all the examples. Well, let's go to the 6.4, which is quite different, but it's still the same information. Okay, 
So you can get some examples from here. You can get some details about the parameters that can use it for these guys. Really, really, really easy to find what you need. And we're gonna talk about some of these functions here, like the maximum, minimal, last, and no data. Also, I have highlighted here trained functions, which are a big deal. Okay, so let's talk about some some of these functions. Okay, one of the most common things that we see during our monitoring are flat. Flapping is a result of really sensitive triggers. And I don't know if you, you guys know this guy here, the flappy bird. All it does is go up and down and give you a lot of trauma. But this is flap. Flapping is like the representation of the movement of the wings of a bird. So yes, this little guy does this. And this is what a graph with a really sensitive trigger can show us about flap. Okay, so <clears throat> every time I have my I have my uh, my trigger here, my trigger expression, I'm saying that I want to get the last value. If the last value collected for this item is greater than two, then I have a problem. So we have this dashed line here representing my threshold every time my the value collected for this item is higher than two, we have a problem. So flapping is really bad for your money. It's not a, a good practice to have flattened scenario. It can happen, yeah, but you need to fix it. So what we have here, your environment is okay, then you have a problem. Okay, every 10 seconds I have the collection of this data here. So after 10 seconds, it's back to normal, and then 10 seconds later, a new problem, and then it's back to normal, and then a new problem. What is the issue with this? If you had set up notifications and alerts, if you have set up your Zabbix to open uh, tickets on your ITSM, every new occurrence here will create a new ticket. And the ticket, ticket will be closed when it's lower than two. This is not good for your monitor. This is not a, a best practice. So you need to avoid it. So I'm using the last function. The last function is actually used a lot for especially for new guys at Zabbix, using Zabbix. And here's how you can still use the, the last function and avoid this kind of flat, flat scenarios. The last function can be really sensitive, yes. And when you use the last function, it may be recommended for you to use recovery expressions. Recovery expressions are, as the name said, expressions that will change the state of your tree of your problem from of your trigger from problem to recover. But there's a condition for this guy to work. The recovery expression will only work if the trigger expression is false and the recovery expression is true. Okay? So you need to make sure that when you are elaborating your trigger, when you're creating your trigger, you need to make sure that these conditions here are met. As an example here, we have, once again, my CPU load graph. And uh, the dash line here, the green dash line, represents the recovery, while the blue one represents the threshold of the problem. So if it not for the recovery expression, we would be having flattened here. So problem, OK, problem, OK, problem, OK, really bad. But with the recovery expression, we are certifying that the problem will only be recovered after it is lesser than one. Okay, the current value is lesser than one. During this period of time here, it's always a problem. Okay, Victor, but the value here is uh, over the, the, the threshold. It's uh, under the threshold. Yeah, but you can think like this. The normal behavior of my system here is that the CPU load 0 0.5. And uh, if it stays over one here, it can be OK. But if it's go over two and then back to over one, maybe we have a problem. You see, uh, all this scenario here represents some, some incident, some problem that you might have. So only after the condition of the recovery expression is met, that will have 
the recovery of the problem as well. Some additional notes on the last function, okay? Uh, the last function does not support time period. We're gonna see some other functions that support time period, but uh, it's not, uh, the last function is only getting the last value. But if we are, we are using the hashtag, hashtag symbol, we can denote the nth previous value. So when I say the last for the, the key for a certain host, hashtag one is the same as not using anything. It's getting the last value. I don't even need to use this parameter, okay? It will get the last value. But here's some, this is a common mistake that most people, especially new people on Zabit, deals with. Uh, when you say last hashtag tree, most people think that you are getting the last three values to be evaluated by the trigger. That is not true. We are actually mentioning the last third value. So let's check here a quick timeline. I have here the last value, okay? The second last value, the third last value, fourth, and then fifth. When I say last host key hashtag tree, I'm getting these value only as a reference, okay? I'm not getting the last three values. No, that's not what's happening. We are just getting here third, the third one. Only this guy is being referenced when we are using this. If you want to make some evaluation of the last values, you can uh, you can use here some other functions or something like this. Let's say that I want to make this comparison. If any of the last three values of this host key is higher than five or whatever, then you have a problem, right? So you are making a comparison of three functions. And if any one of these guys are higher than five, you have a problem. But we can also use some other functions to avoid using the last function. <clears throat> the min function, the minimal value, it will always get the lowest value of an item within a defined evaluation period. So let's say that I have here my evaluation period of 30 seconds. Okay, I have 30 seconds. If the minimum value in the last 30 seconds is less than two, then we have a problem. So here in this first picture, I'm getting 30 seconds. The lowest value is around 1.2, something like that. Okay, but when we get to this point here, when we get to this point, the lowest value within this third second window is higher than two. So from this point on, we have a problem. It's now, it's nine, one and 20 seconds. So it's getting the last 30 seconds here and evaluate, uh, 20 seconds, yeah. and evaluating which one is the lowest. This is the lowest, okay, the lowest is higher than two. We have a problem. The issue then will be solved after the minimum value, the lowest value is lower than is, uh, yeah, is lower than two. So you see that if you, we are using the last function, we would have some flapping here, right? So that's another way on how you can avoid this kind of behavior, the flapping behavior. We can also make use of the cousin of the minimal value, uh, the minimal function function which is the maximum function, which is doing the opposite. It is getting, it's getting the highest value of an item within a defined evaluation. So same, quite, quite the same logic that we have here. I have an ICMP ping item that is collecting zeros and ones, as we all know. And I'm, my trigger here says that if in the last 30 seconds, the highest value, the maximum value collected is equal to zero, then we have a problem. So in this scenario, we have in this example here, uh, we have a zero here, but it's it's normal. It's something common for our network to have some hiccups and we lose some packets over here and there. 
for some reason, just like my small little disconnection during this presentation. But uh, but that that does not does not mean that we have a problem, right? It was just a hiccup. But according to my trigger here, if I had 30 seconds with no response, I want to treat this as a problem. You can increase this evaluation period. You can increase this a lot. Let's say uh, five hours, or, I don't know, 10 minutes, something like this. It depends on the your priority. So at the time that we have the maximum value as zero, which is here, then we have a problem. And once again, this problem will be fixed once the maximum value is not zero, it's different from zero. In this case, one, because we only have zero zeros. Okay. All right, so let's talk about no data function, which is a quite used function for a lot of guys and can also be uh, kind of tricky for newcomers. And not only newcomers, some advanced guys also deal with some things with no data function. So the no data function differently from the last two is a time-based function, okay? So every time Zabis collects a new value for an item, the trigger is evaluated. So you, you can see here, my item is the blue, uh, the blue dot, and every additional 30 seconds, time-based functions such as no data will perform an additional check. So every 30 seconds, I have my function, my no data function checking by itself, even if it's not receiving any value from the, from the, from the item. This is the syntax of the no data function. Okay. We have the host key normal for all kind of functions that we're going to use. We always have a key inside of a host that we want to evaluate. And we have a time period. This time period, because of this condition based for, for the time based, uh, time based functions, we cannot have this time period lesser than 30 seconds. 30 seconds is the the less the less value that we have the lower value that we can we can have for the time period and we also have the mode we're going to talk about the mode in a minute so that this function is pretty straightforward it will evaluate the item if there's no data it returns one meaning okay no data there's nothing there right during this evaluation period Otherwise, it returns zero, okay? So how do we create a trigger for this? Uh, we have the example right here. Come on. We have the example right here. No data function host agent ping with a time period of two minutes. So I'm checking within two minutes, if I don't have any data, then I have a problem, okay? If the output, the outcome of the, my no data expression here is equal to one, then that means we have no data that we have a problem. So let's see, got the value collected here. My trigger expression was evaluated, okay. Additionally, every 30 seconds, okay. Another 30 seconds here. Last time it was collected and 30 seconds, uh, actually 15 seconds after that, there's nothing here, so okay. I have nothing here, 30 seconds later, still nothing. One minute later, nothing. One minute, one minute and a half later, nothing. And two minutes without any data, then we'll have our problem, okay? <clears throat> so the this trigger will be resolved at the moment that we have a new collected value. At the moment that we receive a new value for that item, it's all good, the problem is resolved. But the no data function is actually used a lot. Even on, on, on our out-of-the-box templates, you can find this function being, being used. It's really great function, but it has some tricks to it. First thing that we need to, to understand here is the behavior of the no data function with the proxy. The no data triggers monitor by proxies 
by default are sensitive to the proxy viability. So if my proxy is offline, Zabbix will understand that no data is coming from that guy. Zabbix knows there's no data coming from this guy because this guy is offline. So my trigger by default will not fire. We won't have information. We won't have alerts if my proxy is unavailable. But we have the mode parameter that we can set to strict. The strict mode ignores the proxy availability. So the strict mode doesn't care if the proxy is up or down, if it's online or offline, if it will work as you were expecting to. Okay, so the strict mode will ignore completely the behavior of the proxy. Even if the proxy is down, you know that it's down it's under a maintenance or something like this. If you have set your triggers with the strict mode, they will fire. All right. <clears throat> no data can also return some false positives under certain conditions. The first one here that we're going to mention is time C. You need to make sure that your Zabbix server, your Zabbix proxy, your agent, all your Zabbix components for a really perfect monitoring environment, everything needs to be synced in time. Okay? So Make use of NTP servers. Make sure that the information are like uh, getting all into the same time. This is crucial for your monitor. Here's an example of why it can be it can lead to false positives. Let's say that you have a active proxy that is sending information at ten thirty two. Okay. So it is sending information at 1032. And your Zabbix server is one minute in the future. So 1033. Okay. The time is not synced. You have one minute gap between these two guys, one minute difference between these two guys. So <clears throat> when the information comes from the Zabbix proxy, the active Zabbix proxy to the Zabbix server, it will be registered with the timestamp of the Zabbix proxy. So Zabbix server will always receive this guy here, my battery is dying, sorry, uh, at 10.32, even if the actual clock of the Zabbix server is 10.33. Okay, how does it look like on a graph? I really like to draw. So let's say here that I have my graph, this is now, okay, now. And I have something like this. And at this point here, we have 10, 32, right? So you'll see the gap. Zabbix is, uh, the Zabbix server is running at 10, 33. It's the time of it. But the last time it received the information from me, any item from this proxy was 1032. We have this gap here of one minute. If I have a no data function, no data trigger function set for 30 seconds, it will always check the last 30 seconds. The Zabbix server is the one that's performing the evaluation for the triggers. It's always the Zabbix server. So it's using the Zabbix server time. So no data will report that there's no data here. There's never any data here. And you can open the latest value and you think, oh, but I can see a lot of a lot of things here. Why? Why why don't I have no data? Because of this small difference in time. This can lead to a lot of problems. So make sure, always make sure that your systems are well synced in time. Make use of your NTP server, make sure that everything is running as expected. The other two examples are related mostly to how the items are saved. Uh, discard unchained pre processing is a pre processing step that enables you to ignore repeated values. Okay, so let's take, for example, an item that's collecting ICMP ping values. It's always collecting zero and ones, right? 
clear red solid. But so let's say that I'm receiving one, one, one every minute I have this collection happening. A lot of repeated values over time can overload your database. You don't want to keep a lot of repeated information on your database. So the discard and change it and change it will discard all the unchanged values. Oh. So all these guys will not be saved in the database. They will not be saved. They are just discarded. Okay. And let's say that you have a no data set for this item that is using this pre-processing step. The guy, the, the guy, the 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 trigger, the no data function will take a look at the last minute and would say, okay, I have nothing here. So I will fire. It's a false positive because the discarding chain is still collecting that the item is still collecting that data. It is just in this Discarding it because it's a repeated value. Okay. What can you do to avoid this kind of behavior? You can set up discard and change it with heartbeat, with a heartbeat. So let's say that you set a discard and change with a heartbeat. And every time the heartbeat you set for, for like 30 seconds, say so, you have here uh, the value collected. Uh, zero and then at 10 seconds 20 seconds 30 seconds it met let me just get rid of some lines here so it can look better okay 30 seconds then okay it's the repeated value but i have a heartbeat of 30 seconds i will save this value here and then once again 10 seconds 20 seconds 30 seconds, let's save this value as well. The tip here, the trick he, here is to make sure that the heartbeat is lower than the time period of your uh, of your no data, okay? So if you want to get a start and change it with heart, heartbeat of one day, make sure that your, your uh, no data trigger is set for more than one day or something like that. And history is not saved for the item. There's a lot of things. Let, let me clean my screen. Okay, erase everything. Okay, history is not saved for, for the item. When we are monitoring using dependent items, it's a best practice to do not keep history for the master item. So the master item here, master, will be collecting and the dependent items will be retrieving some information from the master. It's a best practice to do not keep the history values for the master. Since we are not keeping the value for this master item, the, the no data function will understand that there's no data for this guy here. If we set a trigger for the master item, there's no data for it. So the no data, the no data trigger will fire all the time. So if you are using this, there's no sense, it makes no sense to use the, the no data for the master item. Instead, you should use the no data function on the independent, uh, on the dependent item, sorry, not independent, dependent. Because these guys are receiving, are receiving the value instantly after the master item. The master item collects this value, then you have these guys being updated with the current value that has been retrieved from the master. So if you want to, maybe you just need one trigger for this to understand that this guy is not collecting anymore. But make sure that you are setting the no data for the dependent item, not for the master. Okay. And for any item, if you are not keeping history, the no data will not. Okay, let's talk a little about cache because we want to evaluate the long period data. So all this information for the triggers, they are stored in the value cache. The value cache stores these values needed for the triggers and the calculated items. Basically, the guys that use the functions. 
You can have functions being used for the populated items. You can have the functions being used by the triggers. So <clears throat> uh, the value cache we store temporarily inside the Zabbix server, special allocated uh, for the this cache. It's a cache. <laughs> it's special part of the memory is allocated only for to store this kind of information instead of making direct SQL calls to the database. So you are, th this is a resource to protect the database from receiving a lot and lots of calls for old items, for old values, okay? This value cache here is controlled by the parameter value cache size inside the Zabbix server configuration file. And here are the possible values. As you can see, you can set this to zero. Never do this. There's no reason for why you want to do this in a production server. You can set up in a test environment, something like this, just to see what will happen. Basically, no trigger will alert it at all because there's no value there. And Zabbix will start to run uh, on low memory, uh, low memory stuff because it's going to start to make incorrect calls to the SQL. Anyway, never set it to zero in your production environment. And you have the range of possible values from 128 kilobytes up to 64 gigabytes. Okay. Here's an example of what it's doing. If I use the last hashtag 10, last hashtag 10 values for my trigger, it will keep the ninth latest values. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine values stored in the cache. A new value will be received and it will compare here. Which one is the 10th value? This one. So it will use this one instead of the others. Okay, another value is collected. This guy is started, then the 10th value will be this one, and so on. Same thing for the average of one hour. If you have a function of average one hour, it will keep inside the value cache one hour of data for the specific item that you want to only if some value is missing in the cache, the history syncer will read it from the database and insert into the cache. Okay, the cache is here to help you, but you need to help the cache as well. Because sometimes we want to evaluate the behavior of our systems considering months, weeks, even years. And the already mentioned functions are not ideal for the job. Because try to picture it. You have one month of information being stored just to get the average of this guy. One month of information. I don't even know how much that can be. <laughs> but depend, depending on the update interval that I mentioned over in the beginning of this presentation, you can have like items collecting 10 seconds, every 10 seconds, and so on. So you have a lot of data in one month. That's not good for your cache. That's not good. It will be overloaded. And there's no reason for that. For that, we have functions designed for this, which are the trend functions. Trend functions are really simple to understand. OK, we have the function here. We have a period of time that we want to analyze. And we have a period, period shift. Period shift. So let's see some examples of how it is. Okay, we have trend average, trend count, trend sum, trend max, trend minimal. And here it is how it looks. The key host for all these guys are the same. Okay, never changes. Key and host are always present in the functions. And we have here one hour. I want to evaluate one hour from now, one hour ago. So I'm checking the previous hour. This is my limitation. This is the end of my verification. So I have one hour considering now one hour minus one. So two hours ago, I want to check the, the values for two hours for the trend count and so on. These examples are actually available on the documentation. All the explanation for each function are also available on the documentation as I just showed you before. 
And it's really way better to use these guys because in contrast to the history functions, they use trends data for calculation. If you don't know, trends are stored hourly as aggregated values. So let's say that you have an item that's collecting every minute. So in one hour, you have obviously 60 values for history of this guy. After one hour, you have only four trend values, the maximum, the minimum, the count, the amount of values collected, and the average. So four is way lesser than 60. It's way better for your database if you have more trends than, than history, okay? And these functions here, the trend functions, make use of the trend function cache. It looks like the value cache, but is specifically used only for trend functions, okay? <clears throat> if you are going to perform any kind of analysis of long-term, make sure you, you, you use trend functions. It's the best thing that you can do for your system, the performance of your subjects, the, your database. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, trend functions results are cached so multiple calls to the same function with the same parameter fetch in info from the database only once. So the database load goes way down, okay? This cache is controlled by the trend function cache, which has this range of acceptance. Here you have 128 kilobytes up to two, two gigabytes on the Zabbix server configuration file, okay? so. Making use of uh, long-term periods, you want to evaluate long periods, make train, uh, make trends great, <laughs> uh, use train function, okay? So uh, that is, that's it for my presentation. I hope I didn't took too long <laughs> for, for this. But there's a lot of details, I know, but uh, as I said, if you have any doubts, you can review, we'll be able to review this video on the YouTube channel. And you can also always, use the documentation. If you have any doubts, go to the documentation. The documentation is your friend. So Thank I you. guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, currently no questions, but I think since this was quite an elaborate and complex presentation, people will need time to digest it. Like I said, the recordings will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, so this is where we'll be able to see them in a couple of days. Also the presentations, the presentations themselves will be available on the events page. Um, we do have a question. What is the difference between trend function cache size and trend cache size? Great. Uh, uh, the trend cache is when, okay, let's go. When the Zabs is going to perform the calculation of the trends over one hour, it will keep that information inside the trend cache. Okay. So after one hour, Zabbix, the history sinker, will read that cache and give you the actual trends information for those guys. The trend function is specifically used for this kind of, of, of uh, this kind of scenario that we just talked about, for calculated items and for triggers. So these are two separate things. I know that they look alike, but this is the main difference between them. Thank you. I think that answers clearly. One is used for hourly trends, other is used for trend calculations, used in triggers, calculated items, and so on.